Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're in downtown San Francisco at the Twitter headquarters uh, for Data Privacy Day, an interesting collection uh, of people coming together here at Twitter to talk about privacy, the implications of privacy, and, and I can't help but think back to the classic Scott McNeely quote, right? Privacy is, is dead, get over it. And that was in 1999, and oh, how the world has changed. Most significantly, obviously, mobile phones with the release of the iPhone in 2007. So we're excited to really kind of have the, the spearhead of this event, Michael Kai He's the executive director of the National Cyber Security Alliance in from Washington, D.C. Michael, great to see you. Thanks for having us in. So for the folks that aren't here, what, what is kind of the agenda today? What's kind of the, the purpose, the mission? Why are we having this day? Well, Data Privacy Day actually comes to us from Europe, um, from the EU, which created uh, privacy as a human right back in 1981. And we've been doing it here in the United States since around 2000. Uh, and aid, and NCSA took over the effort in, in 2011. And the goal here really is to just help educate people, uh, bi people and businesses as well, about the importance of respecting privacy, the importance of safeguarding information, people's personal data, and then really hopefully with the end goal of building a lot more trust in the ecosystem around the handling of personal data, um, which is so vital to the way the internet works right now. Right, and it's, it seems like, um you know, obviously companies figured out the value of this data long before individuals did. And you know, there's a trade for service. You use Google Maps, you use you know, a lot of these services, but does the, va you know, the value exchange necessarily, is it, is it equal, is it at the right level? And that seems to be kind of the theme of some of these privacy conversations, that you're giving up a lot more value than you're getting back in exchange for some of these services. Yeah, and we, we, we actually have a very simple way that we talk about that. We like to say that personal information is like money, and that you should value it and protect it. And so trying to uh, encourage people and educate people to understand that their personal information does have value and there is an exchange that's going on and they should um, make sure that those transactions are ones that they're comfortable in terms of giving their information and what they get back. Right, which sounds mm -hmm. great, Michael, but then you know you get the EULA, you, know, you sign up for these sure. things and they don't really give you the option. You can kind of read it, but who, who reads it? Who goes through? You check the box and you move on and or you get this announcement, you know, we changed our policy, we changed our policy, we changed our policy. So, I don't know, realistic is the right word, but you know, how, how do people kind of navigate that? Because, let's face it, I, I, my friends told me about Uber, I want to get an Uber, I download Uber, I'm stuck in a rainy corner in DC, and, and I hit go, and here comes the car. I don't really dig into the meat. And, and is there an option? I mean, there's not really, I opt for privacy uh, one, two, three, and I'm opting out of five, six, seven. Yeah, I think we're seeing a little bit more um, granular controls for people on some of these things now, um, but I think that's what we'd advocate for more. When we talk to consumers, they tell us mostly that they want to have better clarity about what's being collected about them, better clarity about how that information is being used or if it's how it's being shared. And, and equally importantly, if there are controls, right, where are they, how easy are they to use, um, and making them more prominent so people can um, engage in sort of making the services tailored to their own sort of privacy profile. And I think we'd like to see more of that for sure. Right, right. Um, you know, more uh, companies being a little more forthcoming. Yeah, you have the big privacy policy that's a long, complicated legal document. Right. But there may be other ways to create interfaces with your customers that make some of the key pieces uh, more apparent. And, and do you see a trend where, because you mentioned in some of the notes that we prepared, you know, that the privacy is good for business and, yeah. and potentially is a competitive <clears throat> differentiator. Are you, are you starting to see where people are surfacing privacy um, more brightly uh, so that they can, you know, potentially gain the customer, gain respect to the customer, the business of the customer over potentially a rival that's got that buried down? Is that really a, a competitive lever that you see? Well, I think you see some extremes. So you see some, you know, companies that say we don't collect any information about you at all. So that's part of out there. And I think they're, you know, marketing to, you know, people who have extreme concerns about this. But I also think we're seeing, again, some places where um, there are more um, higher profile ability to control some of this data, right? Okay. Even in, you know, places like the mobile setting, where sometimes you'll just get a little warning saying, oh, this is about to use your location, is that okay? Or your location is turned off, you need to turn it back on in order to use this particular app. And I think those kinds of interfaces with, uh, you know, the user of the technology are really important going forward. We don't want people overwhelmed, like every time you turn on your phone, you don't, you don't have to answer 17 things in order right, to get right. to do X, Y, and Z, but making people more aware of how the apps are using the information they collect about you, I think is actually good for business. I think actually um, sometimes consumers get confused because they'll see a whole list of permissions that need to be provided and they don't understand 
how those permissions apply to what the app or service is really going to do. Right, right. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I was at a, we were at Grace Hopper in October, and one of the keynote speakers was talking about it and how mobile A has really changed this thing, right? Because once you're on your mobile phone, it uses all the capabilities that are native in the phone in terms of geolocation, the accelerometer, et cetera, about all these things that a lot of people probably didn't know were different on the mobile Facebook app than were on the uh, desktop Facebook app. And let's face it, most of the stuff is mobile these yeah. days, certainly with the younger kids. So uh, as you said, I think that's an interesting tack. Why do you need access to my contacts? Why do you need access to my pictures? Why do you need access to my location? Yeah, and, and then the, the piece that I'm curious to get your uh, opinion, will some of the value come back to the consumer in terms of you know, I'm not just selling your stuff, I'm not monetizing it via ads, I'm gonna give some of that back to you. Yeah, I think there's a couple a couple of things there. One, I, one quick point on the on the other issue there. It's like, so um, without naming names, I was looking at an app and it said it had to have access to my phone. And I'm like, well, why would this app need access to my phone? And then I realized later, well, it needs access to my phone because if the phone rings, it needs to turn itself off so I can answer the phone. Right, right. But that wasn't apparent, right? And so right. I think it can be confusing to people. Like maybe it's innocuous in right, some ways. Right. Sometimes it might not be. But you know, in that case, it was like, okay, yeah, because if the phone rings, I'd rather answer my phone than be looking at the app. Right. And can I read it or can you, I just you know yeah. just see it or you know the, the the degree of the access too is very confusing. Yeah, and I think in terms of the other the, the other issues that you're raising here about you know how the value exchange on data, I think the Internet of Things is really going to uh, play a big role in this because it's really you know in the, in the current world it's about you know data delivering ads those kinds of things making the um, you know the experience more customized. But in IoT, where you're talking about like wearables or fitness or those kinds of things or thermostats in your home, um, your data really drives that. Right. And so in order for those devices to really work well, they have to have data about you. And that's where I think consumers will really have to give great thought to, you know, is that the good value, you know, proposition, right? right. I mean, do I want to share all my data about when I come and leave every day just so my thermostat, you know, can turn on and off? And I think those are, you know, can be conscious decisions about when you're implementing that kind of technology. Right. So there's a, another interesting tack I'd love to, to get your opinion on. You know, we see flow from the progressive commercials advertising to stick the USB in your cigarette lighter and we'll give you cheaper rates because now we know if you stop at stop signs or not. What's funny to me is that the, the phone already knows whether you stop at stop signs or not. And it already knows that you take 18 trips to 7-Eleven on a Saturday afternoon and you're sitting on your couch the balance of the time. You know, as that information that's there somehow gets exposed and, and potentially runs into, say, a healthcare uh, mandated requirement from the company that you must wear a Fitbit. So now we know you're spending too much time at a 7-Eleven and on your couch and how that impacts your health insurance and stuff. And that's going to crash right into HIPAA. Um, this just seems like there's this huge kind of collision coming from, you know, I can provide better service to people at the at the good end of the scale and say aggregated risk models, but then what happens to the to the poor people at the other end? Yeah. Well, I think that's why you have to have opt-in, right? I think you can't make these things mandatory necessarily. And I think, you know, people have to be extremely aware of when their data is being collected and how it's being used. <clears throat> and so, you know, the example of like, you know, the car insurance, I mean, they can only, really should only be able to access that data about where you're going if you sign up to do that, right? right? right. And if they want to say to you, hey, Michael, you know, we might give you a better rate if we can track your, you know, um, driving habits for a couple of weeks, then that should be my choice, right, to right. give that data. Right. Um, maybe my rates might be impacted if I don't, but um, I can make that choice myself and should be allowed to make right. that choice myself. Right. So it's funny, the opt-in, opt-out. So right now, from your point of view, what do you see in terms of the percentage of kind of opt-in, opt-out on these privacy issues? Where is it and where should it be? Well, I would like to see some more granular controls for the consumer in general, right? I would like to um, see, and I said a little bit earlier, a lot more transparency and ease of access to how what's being collected about you and what's being used, you know, outside of the formal legal process. Obviously, you know, companies have to follow <clears throat> the law. They have to comply. They have to be, you know, write these long, you know, EULAs or privacy policies in order to really reflect what they're doing. But they should be talking to their customers and understanding what's the most important thing that you want to know about my service before you sign up for it right. and, and help people understand that and navigate their way through it. And I think a lot of cases, consumers will click, yeah, let's do it, but they should do that really knowingly. If opting in is your opting in, it should be done with true consent. Right, right, right. Okay, so before we let you go, just share some best practices, tips and tricks, 
you know, kind of at least the top level, what people should be thinking about, what they should be doing? Yeah, so we really, you know, in this kind of space, we look at a couple of things. One, like, you know, personal information is like money, value, and protect it. That really means being thoughtful about what information you share, when you share it, who you share it with. Own your online presence. This is really important. You know, uh, consumers have an active role in um, how they interact with the internet. So, you know, use the settings that are there, right? Use the safety and security or privacy and security settings that are in the services that you have. And then, actually, you know, a lot of this is behavioral. What you share is really important yourself. So share with care, right? I mean, be thoughtful about the kinds of information that you put out there about yourself. Be thoughtful about the kind of information that you put about, about your friends and family. Realize that every single one of us in this digital world is entrusted with personal information about people much more than we used to be in the past. Um, and so, you know, we have that responsibility to safeguard what other people give to us, and that should be the common goal around the internet. Yeah. We have to have, to have you at the uh, bullying and harassment convention <laughs> down the road. Yeah, well, great insight, Michael, and, uh, and really appreciate it. Uh, uh, have a great day today. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of terrific content that comes out. And uh, for people to get more information, go to the uh, National Cybersecurity Alliance. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. He's Michael Kaiser. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching The Cube. Thanks for watching.